Hi there. Uh, Hello. my name <laughs> my name is David Greggs, uh, and I'm here to interview Patrick Stewart about art today. Uh, Patrick. Hello, I'm Patrick Stewart. <laughs> Uh, if you've if you clicked on this, you probably know who I am. I do a bunch of uh, uh, old school related uh, role playing game stuff, and I have a Kickstarter running. So I, I'm breaking my si I'm breaking my silence rather than just uh, turning up on a on an interview. I'm boldly speaking out. Okay, so uh, you have a Kickstarter in the works for uh, your blog for False Machine, basically mm -hmm. uh, a book containing almost all the posts. Uh, for how long has it been now? I, I, it just goes the first 10 years. We're in like year uh, 11 now. So it doesn't cover anything from August of 2021. And that would be like 10 years of content. Okay, almost 10 years. Uh, so I found your blog before I found your writing. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, before I f it is your writing, but before I found okay. your uh, role-playing game content um, and all of that, um, and so it's kind of remarkable to find that and then go from that into something like Veins of the Earth, uh, which is, you know, like extremely refined and polished. But when I first found your blog, um, I sort of felt like it on its own was actually a form of literature or something like that or had that quality, um, or at least a lot of it, um, you know, like <laughs> sometimes there's you just pretty, have fun. There's some pretty crap stuff on there and there's, I think there's a few posts to me just having meltdowns. There's by by yearly meltdowns. There's one post where I just scream re about something that I still won't go into. The quality, that's like the quality is um, variable, uh, but you know that there's a lot of stuff on there. So the quality in total is high if you just don't count it proportionately. Right, and so uh, well, I guess just just like with some of your writing, for me it's sort of pushed out the horizons in terms of uh, what was possible for the format or uh, you know what was viable for the format. Um, and so I, I wanted to ask you about, uh, <laughs> this is kind of a random place to start, but it's kind of not. One, one thing people could know if they haven't seen is that for the Kickstarter, the goals are uh, basically commissioning, like when goals are met, it, uh, commission more art for the book mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole bunch of artists on board for it that's why this is sort of like art centric or art themed um, but I wanted to ask you about John Ruskin um, the old Victorian codger um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yeah I wanted to ask you about uh, John Ruskin and what you got out of his writing um, how you found oh. it kind of new it was significant uh, well I've read a bit of On the Stones of Venice. I've read um, one of his shorter books, shorter like texts, and I've seen, I know like bits and pieces about it because if you learn about Victorian art, he's like spread all over the, everything. Um, but basically he's uh, an incredibly sensitive, finely honed, kind of likable, but also intensely neurotic art critic and general social campaigner from the Victorian era who kind of wrote up, did a big book where he went to Venice Rome and looked at basically all of the architecture, ancient and new, and basically classified it and wrote deeply about it and had a big influence. And he was also a big supporter of people like Turner. Anyone who was anyone in the 19th century basically probably had some kind of interaction with him. He wrote a lot. Um, and he was also kind of hilariously, uh, well, neurotic, because he, it, it, with people like that, like there's a lot of interesting stuff around the sides because they just write a lot and they write down almost everything they think. So I think one of Probably what you saw in his my blog was where he goes off on one about ribbons, ribbons in architecture. He fucking hates them, um, and he hates specifically ribbons. He goes into a, like a long tangent about how he uh, how um, a carved stem of a plant has a certain turbidity to it in life, but with a ribbon, there's no life. It just feels fake. It's suddenly he just hates people carving ribbons on things, and also hates trains because they go too fast. Uh, but I also read another book recently by a guy called Tanazaki, who was basically like the Japanese version of Ruskin. He wrote a book called In Praise of Shadows and a bunch of others. But he's like an early 20th century Japanese guy who wrote about like the inherent beauty of like a late 19th century Japanese house and how electric like ruined everything. And I wouldn't go to his favorite restaurant because they wouldn't use candles anymore. And how Westerners try to bathe everything in too much light. And he goes off into a long, there's like half a chapter on 
the philosophical and spiritual beauty of taking a dump in a traditional Japanese style. And it's hard to tell if he's being serious or if he's just that much into it. But you're meant to have like a a privy built of teak outside the house with a view and with like natural grains inside, but aged to a particular, he likes his grains to be aged like with a certain patina on them. And there's a particular like thing beneath that silences any sound. And you just gaze out onto a, like a classical Japanese uh, landscape while you're taking a shit in this very shadowy and textured environment. And you just kind of become one with nature. Um, uh, but, but Ruskin is a bit like that in that he felt so deeply and so sensitively that he often verges straight through reason to enlightening, to parody, to deranged self-parody, all in the space of one thing. Allegedly, he just, he broke up his marriage because when his wife got to stroke for the first time, he saw she had pubic hair and couldn't handle it because he'd never seen it before and ran away, um, which is also peak Victorian. I guess if you take the human psyche and you intensity creates uh effectiveness and sometimes success but also creates a shitload of phobias and mental health problems and neuroses the victorians were and probably the japanese are very intense people so you get a lot it's like squeezing a person you get a lot of juice out but the person left is kind of fucked in the head in a number of ways hello I yeah, that makes sense. Of me. well i'm persuaded to try uh that mode of shitting certainly mm -hmm. uh so, but you, I mean, you really do want to take a dump. You want to go back in time and wander through, like, uh, like a, I don't know, like a May era Japanese house full of like shadows and the best particular grain of paper they use for the walls, and then just kind of go to the toilet and just gaze upon like cranes flying past in the dim light while you take like <laughs> the, the perfect shit. Yeah, if I if I ever go to Japan, I'll, I'm going to try that. Um, but it sounds like he has something in common with uh, with Ruskin in terms of thinking about shadow. It, uh, by the way, I didn't realize that you're, I mean, the interconnection thing you mentioned, uh, I didn't realize that he was a big uh, sort of interplay with the pre-Raphaelites, uh, who I really like their work. And so it doesn't oh. surprise me in some way that uh, um, they were sort of, well, inter interconnected at that time. But um, uh, so it sounds like he has a theory about or thinking about shadow. Uh, in common with the Japanese fellow, um, and that yeah. you've thought a lot about shadow. Do you have for, for veins? Also, generally, I quite like it. Um, I think Ruskin talks about the quality. I'm not sure if it's him or the sculptor. I forget his name, uh, but he talks about the quality of light on a Roman wall versus Northern European, and how a Roman or a Greek wall has like a lot of relatively bright yellow sunlight on it, and it kind of holds its a shadow basically discloses mass to the human eye is one of the main things that tells you about how, how the shape of something, how big it is. It's one of like the algos your eye goes through to tell you like, it's almost like holding something. Uh, and that is why it interacts strangely with like bright light and with color, because it kind of shifts the balance of shadow and changes the mass. And it's also the world of like the half scene. Um, in so just, Gilchrist talks a lot about shadow and kind of a slightly beige, textured 70s-esque romantic the blurring between one form and another and how it creates this kind of flowing indistinct space where it's it, it becomes open to interpretation he thinks it's a very right-brained space where it doesn't have a lot of sharp solid shining objects which is like a an 80s jack children's tv thing or like a, a 1980s car or like a lot of piper male aesthetic where everything is very shiny and very metallic and very solid and it's like in the slightly blurry world of like, uh, you can't tell exactly what things are or where they are. And so if something happens inside the mind where you're kind of shadows call the mind to interpretation to like, uh, instead of just seeing what's there, it's meant to be, or maybe it's just your mind is trying to like penetrate or uh, perceive what isn't there. They're interlinked with the imagination maybe, I don't know. I just like shadows, it's just my, my there are plenty of them up here in Northern England. So I grew up with them. Well, that makes sense. I mean, <clears throat> maybe that's uh, part of the allure of Halloween or something developed early on is that <clears throat> as a little kid, you're walking around at a, at a very low uh, sort of angle to all of these houses. Mm -hmm. And there tends to be a kind of, uh, for whatever reason, under lighting uh, falling on the houses, which I found uh, it was a, a really effective way of making a house beautiful or, or mysterious or, or framing it in a good way is seeing it at night um, with some light coming at it from below, um, just falling on it. Right. Uh, they and do that in monuments light. and museums over here as well. If In the winter, for, for like events, they're always kind of like 
either by flood lamps or by glow lamps, they kind of like push up. And so the space above, you get like the walls and the fragments of the cornices and the space above it becomes this kind of like column of night rising above the building. It does do something. It's also the classic spooky face where you hold your lamp under your face and then suddenly the architecture of your face is completely reversed. And it's like, whoa, uh, that's not a normal human face. That's something else. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, do you think that Ruskin's travels um, in Italy it, like informed a taste for neoclassical stuff or, or um, just Greco-Roman themes in general at that time? I think they did with him. Uh, I'm not that deep in, I think there were so many weird revivalist things going on in the late 19th century, early 20th century. I think like the Houses of Parliament are from them then. And so before like the Swiss style of modernism just hit architecture like a fucking hammer, there was lots of like, let's do medieval, let's do like um, uh, late classical, yeah. I don't know, I don't, there's like the British town hall municipal style, which is this very much pseudo like uh, cargo cult Roman Greek thing with lots of columns. It's like a city hall. If you go to Birmingham, they were the first people to build it. But it's hard to tell apart from the entirety of the Renaissance because the whole European architecture from the Renaissance on is kind of very, very strongly. Let's do Rome. Let's be like Greece. We're the new Romans. So you get like columns and stuff everywhere. Uh, Although I guess in France and Italy, you don't need to do that because you already have the columns and the buildings in many of the places. If you go through Rome, I think you're just going to like knock over a wall. You're going to see something actually Roman. Whereas in the Northern climes, it gets like regurgitated or reshaped into something else. Kind of the same as in America, where it's like, we don't have Roman buildings, but we're going to like do something that's kind of based on them. Oh, I'm blathering. But yeah, not that much Roman building left actually in Britain. So I suppose we had to recreate it or what we thought it was. Yeah, that uh, makes sense. Well, I mean, I love uh, <laughs> Roman or pseudo-Roman uh, architecture in art. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a British thing and an American thing. People know uh, the, the course of history, those, those paintings that, did, that depict massive, you know, um, cities mm -hmm. in that style. This is a, done by an American artist, but there's actually a lot, um, a lot of sort of things like that out there that you can find that have a folder. Um, but then also, you know, giant uh, near Eastern city states and whatnot. I just love it. Big stuff happening, like a John Martin painting. I think that's something Ruskin says. He says, um, there's a kind of veil or a cast over men's minds and size alone can break this. And it's just like, if you make something really, really, really big, it's simple bigness becomes like a, shatters the preconceptions or the, like the inborn assumptions of the mind. And then people start to experience it more fully. And there's lots of like 19th century paintings, which are like, yeah, his Rome falling, John Martin doing, here's the fall, here's like hell itself, here are gigantic caverns, and so on and so forth. That probably links up with, maybe it's the um, the romantic movement, instead of going up for like the majesty of nature, we just reinterpret ancient or forgotten buildings as a kind of pseudo mountain. So now instead of staring at a special mountain, we're like, it's the same kind of effect, massiveness, but now we're adding like, it's no longer based on nature, but we're adding this kind of cultural mix which feeds a lot into the fantasy genre so now instead of just staring at like a cataract falling from a mountain we're staring at like pompeii burning or pandemonium collapsing or rome falling or something like that but it's still like magisterial hugeness and scale but with the mm -hmm. humanity to open into it that makes sense so uh on the subject of the mixture of grandeur and terribleness in some sense and also vastness and uh, throwbacks to ancient or medieval art. Uh, what do you think it is that has given Warhammer 40,000 its staying power, uh, its, its aesthetic undercurrent? Because obviously there was some element of freedom at the start uh, with how they constructed it um, or with how they put it together. <clears throat> but it sort, of, it sort of endured because of an aesthetic quality, I think. I mean, the game I'm sure is, is well made, um, but the, the IP <laughs> the universe, <laughs> well, I haven't played too much of it, but the IP the universe, uh, especially the Imperium, has an aesthetic quality that seems to sort of dwarf uh, mm -hmm. a lot of contemporary IPs <laughs> in, the same, in the same realm. And so what, what elements about it do you think have given it uh, its, its enduring quality? Probably John Blanche and Space Marines are the two major things. John Blanche basically is 
no, probably no other artist as a singularly like has such a massive impact on the background of 40k and what like in particular the high gothic of the imperium and every other artist who came in to begin well not at the very beginning but increasingly from like i think second edition on they were all responding to his style and his style is a lot like john martin's or it's like the big 19th century painters or it's like a bit like turner's um with like these huge washes of color but with like war and death added in and uh there's also the 70s i guess because the 1970s was like the a kind of a cauldron of dirt as far as science fiction aesthetics in many ways went there's books like ridley walker and there's lots of like gloomy archaeotectonic kind of nasty gritty uh fantasy and stuff where everything feels kind of squirmy and it's definitely not it's like the anti-clean it's like texture grot grime ancientness and space marines because they just funded the whole company really i think the space marines like almost 50 percent of their profits and um as soon as they invented those they started selling so well everything else just kind of became built around them and just was essentially responding to creating a universe where space marines would make sense or look cool um and so i think why does why is a space marine really cool? Men like hyper masculine armored figures, especially like teenage boys, really like them. Um, and for some reason, it just hits. I think the Japanese had Gundam, which weirdly enough, the guy who invented Gundam invented them as an anti-military thing. He was quite a pacifist, and so I think I haven't seen them. But the Gundam stories are all about like the horrors of war. And in Britain, we invented like space marines, who are sort of uh, depending on how, well, you can view them different ways, but they're kind of horrific, but also noble. Yeah, I, that that that's I I, w- I couldn't probably narrow it down more than just saying John Blanche and his like, I guess Ian Miller was there as well, but he left relatively soon. He's also an exceptional and incredible artist, deeply original, very textured, but probably didn't have. There were just a lot of really good artists in the seventies. I don't I don't know why these things seem to come in waves. Um, a lot of really great fantastic artists hanging out in Britain in the 70s and available for cheap as well. Uh, some combination of the education system, whatever was around for them to vibe off and the advances in printing technology probably just made it possible. And the birth of like otaku or gamer culture in the UK based around like Ian Livingston Sir and Steve Jackson, they did. They started Games Workshop, they did the first fighting fantasy books. I think those were based on an American pattern but they're also very odd and their illustrations are by people like Ian Miller, John Blanche, people like that, who are just like uh, Russ Nicholson, who are just like these, like, why is this in a kid's book? <laughs> when you're a kid, especially in a modern phrase, you wouldn't think like, um, you just accept whatever's given to you. But looking back on it, it's like, this is way too good to be in a kid's book. It's too, and too strange as well. But I guess there's just like um, a culture of giving kids quietly very in- intensely weird things, <laughs> at least in Britain. And I don't know where it comes from. <laughs> No, well, that's what you want when you're a kid anyways. I mean, if it doesn't, like, uh, you know, scar you and make you run away, if it's right on that line, then, you know, that's right. what feels like actual exploration, you know, something that's uh, maybe slightly outside of your competence <laughs> to deal with, right. but not too far. Um, so what, was Blanche the first to sort of add in, um, I don't want to say, like, Catholic, not theology exactly, but, um, you know, visual themes at the very least. Uh, you mentioned in the form of High Gothic. Was he the first to throw that in, or...? I think so. I think it was him. I'm not like deeply enough afraid. I haven't done like a. I've got a copy of Road Trader, which is the first Warhammer 40k book, and then it changes a lot between Road Trader and Edition One and Second Edition. By the time you get to the Second Edition, it looks and feels like the Warhammer we know, and I think in between it's kind of edgy. But I think it's Blanche, uh, probably the dominating factor. Also, the design team at Warhammer. People like um, Brian Nelson, Jess Goodwin, they were definitely, they have like a massive effect on the models themselves. They they basically, the company runs off the models, really. That's the what makes them money. And the, the design team comes up with something cool. I suspect they have like the biggest single vote in what goes forward that they can get it to sell. Um, and I think they were vibing off Blanche as well. But there was a, a bit, I don't, that's more, where, yeah, I think it was him who started the Catholic thing. He started like the high gothic thing. I think most of it probably leads from him. If anyone in the comments knows differently, I'm eager to be corrected. But as far as I know, he was the single dominating factor in that. That makes sense. Well, there's kind of like a welding between uh, grandeur and, you know, terribleness 
uh, all throughout it that I, I had noticed in some of the artists that you have queued up for uh, Speak False Machine. I mean, obviously they're on different wavelengths, but uh, there does, some, does seem to be something very effective about touching both ends of the spectrum at the same time, uh, or at least in the same IP um, that gives a sense of weight or something, a sense of significance. Mm -hmm. So something like a Space Marine, uh, you know, obviously you have the beautiful armor and, you know, the beautiful ships and, uh, you know, the stateliness and grimness from, you know, dealing with what they're surrounded by, which is, you know, like the writhing tendrils of the Tyranids or, you know, like the filth of chaos and all of that stuff. And there seems to be something uh, powerful about the contrast seen in the same place so that it's not all one way or the other. It's not, it's not noble bright and it's not, you know, um, mm -hmm just like the pure post-apocalyptic where everything's ruined forever yeah it's a complex moral and aesthetic uh basically universe where you can inhabit it while you're playing a game or reading from any one of a dozen perspectives and consider yourself to be like in the right or uh but then you since all of them are tragic you can easily step back going back in a different way and see like from a completely different point of view uh Unless, I guess, unless you have the Tyranids, in which case it's just like, we need, we're going to eat everything. I don't, I don't know if they're, they're experiencing any tragedy, but uh, all the orcs who are having fun. Yeah, then you're just having fun. Um, okay, so when did you, I, I know that you've probably uh, been reading since you can remember, um, but when did you start noticing art in your own uh, personal life? Like, when did, when did art start becoming significant for you? Oh, that's a good question. That's a difficult one to pull up. What's my earliest memories? Um, I remember when I encountered Warhammer art for the first time, which I was around 13 on the school bus because my friends had a copy of White Dwarf. What was there anything before that? See, I used to read a bunch of traditional British comics when I was very young, like the Dandy and the Beano. And their art is like done in a kind of Herge-esque single line clear style but the content is quite raucous and bizarre what about before that the stuff that sticks out earliest is stuff like really simple comics i think it was art that was doing something that's what lodged in my memory the most before that hmm, what did i have on my wall i think i had pictures of aeroplanes i think i had the lockheed uh the lockheed martin stealth bomber what else did i have on there Ah, it's fled into memory. I think probably I didn't really understand art as art until I was hitting like 13 or 14. The rest of the time, it was just like an access way to whatever the art was about. So in my mind, I was just interested in this is a really good cartoon. This is a really good plane. This is a really good scene of something. It's just a really good monster. And the fact that the art was good was just kind of, I didn't really, I was just like, Vroom inhabiting it like it was a doorway to another world. And then it was only later on that I started to understand that the doorway was a thing in itself and it was in fact the actual thing rather than the, the world that I was imagining behind it. Did you look into uh, anything technical about it or did, were you mostly pursuing uh, particular artists or, or themes? Uh, I, I, I still don't know anything about art really. Everything I've picked up has been completely accidental from like researching uh, color or architecture or um, different like um, illustrators and reading from the artists themselves. But yeah, I still, I, I, I don't know anything technical about art other than just fragments that I picked up from being like a, a self-educated weirdo, really. I, I, last time I did art as any kind of formal study was back when I was like in secondary school, so around 15 years old. And then you didn't really learn much. I think I remember I liked the futurists, which I still do. Uh, I didn't like the Impressionists, which I still don't, even though they're kind of two sides of the same coin in some ways, occasionally. Uh, but that's about, no, I'm not, I'm not technically or uh, formally educated in it to any extent. Yeah, well, I agree with you uh, about the Impressionists and the Futurists. Um, well, you, <laughs> you have been doing one kind of uh, informal study into art, which is doing a lot of painting miniatures. Um, yeah recently and so well, but um, yes. well they're kind of striking like the miniatures that you paint uh 
uh, you're kind of you're kind of humble about your ability, but they're visually striking. And so I wanted to ask you if you have um, what your approach is, what you want to get out of it. Um, I mean, obviously it's it's fun. Obviously it's it's satisfying. But uh, I'm wondering if you're trying to test out any ideas or approach in a particular way. Well, there are a bunch of really great miniature painters and devices, and that was kind of who I was fantasizing about being like. And I thought, I'll start doing this. I'll use the miniatures to get out of the house and meet people because I'll play games. And hopefully one day I'll be really good at it. And I didn't really get that great at it. Um, and I didn't manage to because COVID it, I didn't really get out of the house much Then I moved to the country or suburbia. Um, so I didn't really get to leave the house. And basically I stapled together a bunch of different techniques. You probably, I don't know if you know this, but basically in the miniatures painting, there's like, different layers or levels or ways of looking at it. And one of them is army painting, where you basically try to complete an army and get it on the board and finished. And that way you basically are treating the army itself as the object of, as the object of art. And that doesn't show up very well on Instagram or in photos because it's really hard to photograph a, an army very well unless you have like professional gear with you when you're really good at it. And the other is single miniature painting which is very, 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 very high quality at the highest levels. Let's say I, I, um, there's a kind of competition called Golden Demon, where if you look at the finalists, they're people who are genuinely very good high artists, but they happen to be working in this medium and their skill level is like very fucking high. And so what I worked out was that I, I probably don't have the patience. One thing you need to learn to do to be a miniature painter is to get patience and uh, learn everything you can and get very good hand-eye coordination. I'm very impatient. And I'm very impatient with my learning. So I thought I probably never will be good enough unless I change my personality completely to be like a um, single miniature painter. But I really like collecting and arranging things and organizing them. And it became a kind of, uh, I guess, the middle one piece inside clean your room thing. It's when I, when I have a lot of stress or I'm dealing with stuff that I can't control, which is usually work. I usually can control this relatively small arrangement of uh, miniatures and ideas and what I learned is that there's some things I really like and what I really like is the undead and I kind of like uh the classical undead and stuff like decay and organic forms partly because I like them but also because they're relatively easy to paint to a medium high level because you can organics and scales feathers and skin all respond really well to stuff like dry brushing and value creation through i think they call it slap chop now but basically you can create one of the things you do with the miniature is you're trying to add more value that's difference between light and dark than you would ever see in the actual miniature it was just there naturally again that's to try and again we're back to shadow you're trying to delude the eye into thinking it's seeing something real so you're creating these depths of shadow and these heights of color and one way to do that is to basically use a combination of an air can and dry brushing and to just paint the miniature purely in black and white or black and one other color, painting purely the light itself and not the color. So you just create this like architecture of uh, shade between very, very dark and very, very bright. And then you go over that with much thinner paints, uh, like uh, speed paints or inks. And with that combination, you can add color and you keep the value, but you don't need to be super skilled, like a highly skilled single miniature painter would be able to simultaneously add color and value to any part of the miniature through an incredibly like laborious but elegant series of layers and patterning. Whereas the other way you can do it is just kind of cheap, which is what I do. But it's some weird combination of producing an aesthetic object, arranging like the background or the law. And I like bashing or creating mild alterations, sometimes um, sculptural additions, sometimes like adding bases and things. I guess it's just I'm happy to be making things with my hands that don't really matter that much. Uh, yeah, that's about it. They tend to yeah. look as armies. If you come over and see them, they look all right. Uh, yeah. And producing this synergy between the imagined constrictions of the imagined world, their use as playing pieces, where they help so they have like a unified but varied color scheme and other stuff. It just um, a, it's a it's a pleasing hobby for me. Yeah. Well, the uh, idea of painting on shadow before you uh, even do the top layers, I hadn't heard of that before. Uh, that's fascinating. It makes sense. Um, and I know that you do a little bit of, you know, modeling 
you know, doing a little bit of custom modeling on them in addition to the uh, painting itself. So I was gonna ask you if your thoughts about mass and shadow and uh, also in this case, seeing them from above and how they look from the actual, you know, like bird's eye perspective uh, has informed your, the way that you do modeling. Uh, a lot, I think, because what looks good in, um, what looks good in a photograph and what looks good from the God's eye perspective on a table is very different. And generally, if you're looking at something from a God's eye perspective, you want relatively strong crossing forms so that, uh, like, I'll show you this. I don't know if you can see this lady, but I stuck this vampire lady on a, like a, a ghost boat so that when she's on the table, she forms like a pretty standard swoosh and then a hard line through it. It's kind of like what Frank Frazetta does when he makes paintings. He has this idea that you make a diagonal in the painting of like, which somehow projects energy. But if you're trying to make something that's like a playing piece to be seen from afar, you want like the meter structure to be kind of quite bold and almost oppositional. But like the, when you get into the details, you want it to have like character and life. So it's sort of like building a um, two sculptures. One, you build like this simple sculpture in the air, this arrangement of form that is just like uh, dynamic, almost, you could break it down really easily. And then once you're trying to do the details or trying to arrange it so it has details, you get further into it and then you kind of embroider or arrange for things to be in certain places. So there's like, what Warhammer design is called pace. There's meant to be like, or works of this kind of a flow of detail and space that moves across the miniature. If everything's very detailed, it kind of sucks unless the miniature is meant to be about that. It's like hyper baroque, in which case, if it's like adding more and more and more and more and more, then that can work in some cases. In some cases, stripping it back so there's less and less and less and less and everything's very smooth can work. But for most things, you want that to be like, Detail information, flow, then a bit of detail, then flow, then a bit of detail, then flow. And so it hits behind this kind of like, it, it feels natural and correct. And it speaks to the eye and the eye kind of reads the figure as like, here's a little person who's also a relatively attractive image, who's also interesting in encapsulation of space. That's like interesting. Yeah, well, in that case, it's almost like the space marines are like this anchor that all of these spiky forms swirl around. Mm -hmm. I mean, a space marine or, or a dreadnought or something like that is very, uh, unitary shape, at least relative to the other stuff that might be on on the on the board. But then, I mean, it has all these fine details laid into it, laid into its smooth surfaces. But you know, compared to the Tyranids, the Dark Eldar, or something like that. One of the reasons they changed them recently is because they worked out the original Space Marines are smooth, and they worked out you could basically put more and more and more detail into a Space Marine. And they did a big change in them where they changed them to more true scale and their basic forms have been stripped right the way back down again so there's almost no embroidery and again it's very smooth planes of form uh and some people are very upset because they wanted that hyper baroque uh, they miss it uh and so now they're going <laughs> they're trying to please the audience by building them back up adding more and more and more and they'll be eventually they'll add too much and they'll um i guess i know everything with involving warhammer is silly depending on how you look at it, but there's kind of like a curve where you add like one extra detail or like um, one extra skull face. So like you can put a certain number of skulls on something and then you just add them and add them and add them and it looks cooler and cooler and cooler. And then at some point you put one skull too many on and suddenly it's just like, oh, you've gone too far now. <laughs> it just looks ridiculous. But a lot of like the like the um, design uh, kind of like flow with normal is then just doing that continuously. It all, add more and more and more and more. The audience goes, oh, we don't like that. And then they'll go all the way back to the start and the audience goes, oh, we don't like that, it's too simple. So they'll start adding more and more and more. And that was Space Marines especially, I think. What do you think of the development of various kinds of, uh, I guess you could say infantry in uh, <laughs> Games Workshop IPs? Because the Marine, I mean, obviously the Space Marines have gotten kind of lankier and more tactical and you know the, the way that they're depicted. Whereas, you know, like for, for a long time, it seems like, they didn't do a whole lot of like major experimentation with um, the uh, the basic looks of infantry. I mean, you you mentioned a lot of uh, variation in terms of detail, but recently for um, I guess Age of Sigma or whatever, they they've been releasing all of these chaos militias of various kinds, or or actually just now with the uh, kind of like all boxed arena battles, they have militias in forty k. Whatnot, uh, where each each character has a lot of detail and doesn't look anything like 
Space Marines or traditional Imperial troops mm -hmm. uh, or other militias like that. It seems like they're doing a lot of experimentation uh, in an interesting way. And I've wondered if you've looked into those at all. I have a bunch over here, actually. But yeah, skirmish detail in a skirmish game and detail in an army are like work really differently because an army ideally is meant to be read as a whole thing. And if everything's busy, it looks weird. But in a skirmish game, it's like everyone can be their own special little sculpture. But largely across Age of Sigma and with 40K, they've been longifying and true scaling a bit more than they used to be. At Games Workshop minis tend to be, or were made to be quite squat and wide with big ass weapons. So they were kind of like um, exaggerated somewhat in order to create a strong impression. It fits with the generally masculine aesthetic of something being very like chunky and big and that applies both to the uh, normal guys and the Space Marines and pretty much everything else. The early Stormcast are like massive chunky dudes who have almost no like navel. It's just like chest and then legs. And then they change those again to things that look more true scale. I think part of the reason they're doing it is I think they're trying to unify their visual representation across all media. And if you're producing cartoons or comics or live action, the stuff that looked really good on the tabletop isn't going to look good as a live action thing. And so they've done the same thing with Dreadnoughts, where they've Dreadnoughts used to be these insane wide boxes, um, which don't really work as like living things, but kind of did work as kind of living tomb as like tomb symbols of like here's a guy, here's a paraplegic guy, we should do him in a death tomb and he's going to attack. And so they changed that until something that could like functionally walk down animation. I think that's what they're trying to do. But I think they're going to run into trouble or at least complications because their weapons are still ridiculously chonky. And as their awareness and as, as they reformat their models to get more and more true and exact, the crazily disproportionate guns and blades that often looked quite good on old models because everything was kind of like hyper expressive are starting to look weirder than they used to on these normal sized, more gracile and more reasonable looking people. Uh, yeah, well, that, <clears throat> go on. I think what happened as well is copyright because <clears throat> they had a big court case against like a relatively minor studio. And as a result of that court case, this, I think it was mainly US law that came up with, this is the stuff you've done. I mean, you consider this your copyright property, but all of this stuff, not so much. And so they began to realize that a lot of their miniatures were not copyrightable. And so they're moving everything over to stuff that could be copyrighted so they can protect it across multiple media. And that, pleasurably enough for me, has meant that although you've lost a lot of classical old fantasy stuff, everything new has to have its own name, which is often bad, but also has to have its own form. Everything has to be reimagined in a way that the company can more precisely own so they know what the company can say, oh, this is just a version of our thing. And so because they've had to reimagine everything, and there was another rule that said, I think, if you don't have a miniature of it, and if you've never produced one, you can't really sue someone else for producing a miniature of it. And so all the stuff they had in background that they didn't have miniatures for, they're now desperately trying to produce at least one version of it. And that feeds into the skirmish games where it's like, here are the Imperial Breaches, here's like the Admech, uh, like Stealth Squad, here's the crew guys. We didn't talk about these guys very much previously, but now here they are. And we definitely own these and we produce these minis and we don't and these rogue traders and we don't want to hear anyone else saying that they own them uh so for me it's been like for once copyright works in favor of art and creation because it forced the company to innovate and, and to produce a wider spectrum of things instead of just being like uh most corporations unless they're nudged i think will kind of sink into a kind of uh passive resentment of an easily exploitable nerd class most nerd companies kind of invent to begin with. They expand, they appeal to a wide variety of people. The people who are most into it is like the hardcore or autistic nerd boys who will just obsess and buy the new thing because it's new and who are also vaguely angry at the company, but they will keep buying stuff. And because you can rely on them, whenever the company goes through troubles, it just kind of produces for that hardcore of autistic nerd boys and gradually forms into a kind of relationship of mutual contempt with them as the life and the energy for drain away from the company and its creative staff and the like its main marketers get more and more resentful and it's just like they clearly don't like each other very much and games workshop tends to fall into that but has was briefly kicked out of it by a, a corporate takeover and by um a, a court case they may they'll probably try and sink back into it because most companies 
innovation isn't a smart corporate policy in most cases. Even if you work in the artistic field, the most efficient thing to do is to just copy what everyone else does and do it slightly differently and charge them at most you can and to not be very creative, but to be very efficient. And so there's always a war inside every kind of cultural creative cooperation between <laughs> there are people in there, you need to create something, otherwise you can't own it. And you have these creative staff who keep trying to do things, but then the numbers say, don't, don't create anything. <laughs> Just regurgitate and renew and do another like Disney movie, do a live action Disney, do anything. Just keep keep control of the copyright and produce the same thing again. Well, I mean, I guess this, I'm glad then <clears throat> that they faced that uh, potential loss in court if it kind of woke them up. Um, <laughs> because, but, you know, I've enjoyed a lot of the uh, random, you know, minutely detailed stuff that they've been uh, putting out recently. And I guess their, their quality assurance at least is, is good enough or they have good enough creative people on staff that, you know, if they're going to do something in the Warhammer IP, I guess they're probably the ones to do it. <laughs> so, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, uh, in the new Dark Tide game that came out, it's like Vermin Tide, but for Warhammer 40,000, I haven't seen a single Space Marine. Uh, I haven't seen a single bolt gun um, in the entire thing so far, depicted once. Um, there's lots of, you know, modeling for inquisitorial characters and, um, you know, their troops and, uh, and especially for, you know, various kinds of chaos characters, but none of them are space marines or chaos space marines. Um, and they'd really be, be, you know, like lumbering and it'd be hard to know exactly how to joint them and all of that stuff uh, if they were actually being depicted in 3D there. Have you seen Astartes? That's still available, I think, on their website. It was like a major fan-made animation about space marines and it's very 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 good um and it captures the weird combination of at least infection they're meant to be massive and armored and terrifying but then to move so quickly that it's unnerving uh, and that animation really captures the sense of this kind of armored tank man who can move like a dancer and never misses <laughs> never misses a single shot uh, these kind of uh, magisterial monsters moving with like a, the high speed of a futurist painting. But uh, the Games Workshop had a meltdown and basically decided they couldn't allow fan animations to exist online anymore unless they owned them and basically launched a slow taker over, over all of them where they either gave them DMCs to shut them down or snaffled them up and brought them inside the company where they haven't produced that much so far, but they might do. Hmm. Well, I'll have to find it then if it's, uh, you know, an endangered species in some sense. So before we go into talking about uh, the artists who you have uh, queued up or at least interested in for uh, Speak False Machine, uh, I wanted to ask you one last thing, which is do you have any favorite themes uh, in historical art? Not, not just visual themes, but in terms of also what it's depicting. Probably unsurprising to anyone, like the classic John Martin, here's a city being destroyed. Disaster is always good. Uh, for art, uh, scenes of high drama. There's some extremely... Who did that painting of, like, the Emperor Hebe Hebeoglavius drowning his courtiers in, in petals? There's one of... That's a really good painting. Um, to be honest, any insanely high-status, deeply hierarchical culture that's painted later on produces great art because the entirety of the culture is based on dec decadence and display. And usually a 19th century artist will come along and say, I'm going to paint the Emperor Hebrew Glabus, or there's a whole bunch of like um, Orientalist paintings, which are like, here's a magnificent sultan surrounded by babes. Uh, the, the synergy between the display of the culture and the later on, sometimes orientalization of it through, through art is excellent. I like a good ruin. I'm never really sad when I see a ruin or a storm, basically. Uh, and I like a good nocturne, whatever it's of. Uh, that's a bunch of very good, World War One arts art. There's one actually in Birkenhead down the road in the library, but it's probably not like even for me, it's not the kind of thing that I would want on my wall day to day. Yeah, I went on an auction kick recently. Had a tab open um, for just a huge collection of it for uh, a while, just trawling it. Um, yeah, and I like naval battles, which is a form of you know, like I guess a form of disaster and high drama too. So I mean. Oh, yeah, um, you, you you probably just if you're gonna throw a dart and land in a body, you probably be you probably want to be born in a you know in a republic, just generally speaking. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if it's great for public aesthetics because it's got to be you know distributed across the population. You know, like please everybody to the minimum necessary degree. So it doesn't always 
uh, have the best aesthetics. But the good news is we we inherit the the great art from the ones who came before and don't have to be peasants or you know that kind of thing. So there's some great um, Victorian art of imperial triumphs and disasters. Uh, of like the British army either succeeding or failing catastrophically and on a massive scale, usually with a general dying in the foreground and just like in a world without cinema, it's like I'm, I need someone who can paint like a billion guys in the back of this painting. The painting needs to take up the size of a, a wall and like let's go. There's a few of those knocking around. There's one in the um, gallery down the road, which is of Waterloo, which is um, I think it's the charge of a particular cavalry regiment, and it's just like the painter went. I want to see a million guys in a painting on horses charging at each other and trying to bash each other's heads in. And it's uh, great. You can just sit there for <laughs> half an hour reading the image and trying to pick out the individuals. Yeah, giant battle scenes are uh, a lot of fun. Okay, so, um, well, we can move on and, and talk about Speak False Machine and uh, the artists who are going to be involved in it. Um, so you've been, you've been blogging for... A long time. This is ten years for this uh, for this book that's coming together. Um, do you have any thoughts about the blog, just as such, um, and how it is, and how it has, you know, become over time and all of that? Uh, I'm very grateful that it happened. I'm kind of mystified that it did, and I'm worried <laughs> that it won't be. Good. I mean, it's on Blogger. I keep thinking that it's just going to die at some point because people just won't go on Blogger anymore. Uh, and I know everyone else involved with the OSR is either like looking into TikTok or whatever. Oh, like social media companies are always dying and being reborn. So it's kind of strange to me that it's still going. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I was always like a, a failed writer up until I started that blog because I had lots of weird ideas and nowhere to put them. And I couldn't finish projects because I was maybe I was too young or just too messed up. But when blogging came along, when there was a culture of people reading each other's blogs and when there was an excuse you to be able to write almost about anything and where in, it prized invention, it was just like a, I got very, very, very lucky. Uh, and finally, I remember the first blog post I did, 11 people read it and I was very excited. I showed someone, I showed my girlfriend at the time, look, 11 people have read this, which was a big improvement for me. And it seems to fit, like comics, blogs, especially OSR blogs, seem to fit well with an overflowing of conceptions. And if it's a blog post, you have a good excuse for it not being that well worked out. Uh, so if you have a lot of ideas, you can blog. And if you're me, you can kind of blog about anything because I essentially just start, I, 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 I ignored whatever the primitive version of SEO was and just wrote about anything that was interesting to me at the time. And so my personality became the brand of the blog. And so I'm now relatively free to write about almost anything I want on there. Uh, very, very, very strange fortune. And I wonder what would have happened if I missed that gap between the blogger blogs, the OSR getting big and not, or if I'd been, been doing something else or, yeah, I wonder what my life would have been without it because it's, it's dominated my creative and even my financial life more and more over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Do you ever go back and read posts from way back when? Just kind of trawl through them? Or do you leave them Sometimes, yeah. I, when I was putting together um, Speak False Machine, I went through the whole <laughs> thing and basically tried to arrange everything by subject and classify everything. And I was kind of amazed. Uh, I was like, this guy really likes reading books. There's so many old book reviews. And sometimes I'll hit something where it's like, oh, damn, this is really good um, and long. And I, I don't know what it is. It's really hard. It's, ever since I started actually writing books, um, those super long 5,000 word, like I think I did a 5,000 word or longer thing about Black Lamb, Grey Falcon by Rebecca West. And I remember writing that and I carried around like a pen and a pad and I fiddled with it for like weeks beforehand, gradually building up ideas and adding them in and then wrote it in one go. And I can't imagine doing anything that long now. I'm kind of simultaneously immersed. I guess it's an old man looking at a much younger man's free time and uh, infinite degree of energy. It's like, wow, you really went hard on that one, didn't you? <laughs> like uh, nowadays, I barely have the time to review the books that I do read, but back in the day, I could go on for like a, a massive essay every now and then. And I remember I did, a pretty good review of Fairy Queen 
which involved reading the entirety of the, like the whole thing and blogging individually about each part. And it's like, how the hell did I do that? Because the, if you've read that, you know that the Fairy Queen is very long and very like uh, rich in its text and also really bad towards the end and intensely and insanely racist and anti-Catholic. And basically the, the Protestant lunacy, which was always there to begin with, kind of gets completely out of hand and it becomes deadening. And it's like, wow, I'm, I'm impressed you finished that because I strongly suspect that many of the people who write about a lot of very old books just never finish them. And I suspect there are many like cornerstones of the Western canon that 90% of the people who've read them never got all the way through because a lot of them are pretty bad once you get towards the end and are frankly too long. Uh, yeah, there's there's some parallels between the Fairy Queen and uh, Black Lamb, Grey Falcon uh, uh, <laughs> there, um, which is you know an amazing an amazing book uh, although i guess for her the germans are kind of like the catholics um but <laughs> with, with more of a reasonable excuse because it was like pre like hate hating german and anglo hating germans pre-world war ii is like more understandable and excusable than an anglo hating the irish during the plantation of ulster it's more like no not entirely the same thing yeah yeah absolutely okay so uh shall we talk about artists Oh, yeah, specific sure. artist. Okay, so um, we'll just go through uh, in the order of funding, basically, <laughs> the order that <clears throat> they're listed in the Kickstarter. Um, I want to just ask you about how you found them, if you have any general thoughts about the art, what attracted you to it, um, and all of that. So starting off with Simone to Meta, um, it's like pure shadow. Uh, most of the images give a sense of something being spotlit in a cavern, uh, which is sort mm -hmm. of on brand for, for, you know, Patrick Stewart and False Machine and all of that. Um, so uh, do you think, work together with Morkborg in the first place or? Uh, no, not at all. I, well, I, not that I remember. Uh, he came to, I did a post saying, I'm going to do this book called Speak False Machine, uh, blah, blah, blah. I need artists. And a few different artists came forward, I think. He was one of them, and he was by far my favorite. Mm -hmm. uh, as I looked through his variations and stuff, and then when I gave him, like, I told him, you're going to be doing interior art. A lot of it won't be, like, very interesting. You'll be in the book more than anyone else, but a lot of the images are very small. Some of them are just diagrams, and he still wanted to do it. I was like, well, this is great. This guy whose art I like anyway was willing to accept, so like, the, the, the not that great job of filling spaces. So I was very pleased. If you want to check him out, he's a old raging barbarian uh, on Instagram or, or just Simone to Meta. And yeah, he did art for Morkborg, which fits because again, the aesthetic, uh, the, the, there's a unifying aesthetic there. Yeah, so, okay, cool. So next is uh, somebody who, I mean, no discussion about art with you would be complete without, you know, diving into which is Scrap Princess. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, Scrap Princess is like, some people like to say that they think of art as a craft, and of course, art has a craft, <clears throat> a craftsmanship aspect. But I think uh, Scrap Princess is like the pure distilled, uh, not not counter to that exactly, but just uh, whatever whatever you know art can contain that is beyond craftsmanship is is in her art, just raw power. I mean, obviously, she she has the ability to do you know craftsmanship. Mm -hmm to art but in terms of just imaginative explosiveness or just connecting deeply to the circuits in you um her art is mm -hmm. is like that so uh how do, do you have anything to say about working with her on this or what coming uh, out basically if you know me at all you know that i've always made books with scrap and um, my first one from like deep color observatory to veins there we've, we've always worked together worked together on a whole bunch of things um and so when i was putting this book together i just told scrap uh, I'm doing this, and they told me, okay, I'll do, I'm doing, like, the cover for it, and I was like, okay, well, I'm not really having, like, a cover in that those terms, but can you do, like, the um, the end pages and, like, a uh, an interior cover image, and they're like, yes. So it was unquestionable that I would have some scrap art unless to begin with. They were, they were like, my, they're not even counted as, in, as an artist, they're in, like, the production team, because they're just uh, <laughs> an assumed person. Scrap will yeah. also be doing like the design for like the foil uh, title page and the spine, which will also be massive because it's a really thick book. Mm -hmm. How did that collaboration begin in the first place? You just find some art and you know, decide uh, to go forward. I think forward. we were aware of each other's stuff through blogging and 
uh, when Zosha Kowalski hired me to make Deep Calm and Observatory, he asked me who I wanted to do the art, and I said scrap. And then from there, we went on to do the art for Veins of the Earth and just accelerated from there. All right. So um, moving on, we have Jason Thompson. And I want to emphasize this is Jason Thompson of Mockman Press, mm -hmm. not the other guy who does uh, like. I don't know, very flat geometric art that I don't find very interesting. Whereas Jason Thompson for this project, his stuff is very intricate and very full, just mm. all over. And so um, how'd you find him and how'd you, uh, what do you think of his art? I think the first time I've been, if you're watching, Jason Thompson is very famous in OSR circles for doing these giant magisterial kind of uh, drawings with a cartoony style where he'll encapsulate the entirety of a well-known adventure in this single image, which takes in the entirety of the space. And then he'll weave through the uh, process of a typical or unusual band of adventures as if, as if they were going through the space, but also involved in the various scenes. And it's just like one giant image, which is a map, also a cartoon, also a kind of like a epic scale imagining. So that's where I knew him from. And I, I uh, looked at his other stuff as well. I think based on that, he did a comic about like uh, the Dreamlands. And he did a bunch of other comics, um, which I think are really good. You can see one of the images for that on um, on the Kickstarter and you can see more on his Instagram or Twitter. I was trying to work with him for a long time. Uh, I was actually involved in a certain project because he, oh, hold on. He produced a certain game uh, and had a company involved with it, and I was working on it, and then basically ducked out because I didn't really like the conditions, not because of him, but because of the. Um, I was used to being able to do things on my own, and the work for hire was rubbish. Uh, but I was always kind of wanted to do something with Jason Thompson, and maybe one day I still will do an adventure with him. Uh, but um, if I had like a list of people who were on my to get list, he was definitely on there. Uh, and what can be said about him? I think I've described his paint, his main famous line works well enough. It's this combination of it's time and space unified in something which is both a painting and uh, a narrative and a map. It kind of fits very well with the theme of um, and window to another world and uh, something which is simultaneously a work of art to be gazed upon, but also like uh, something to be engaged with as you kind of step inside it and are absorbed by the emotions of these tiny little balloon-headed Greek men as they encounter terrible and remarkable events in sequence and you've kind of go along and live with them simultaneously dying alongside them but also observing them through like the window of his art. Makes sense yeah there's some commonality with uh, Dirk who I mean we'll get to in a bit in that way uh, although I think his work is you know depicts unified universes in some way a little mm. bit more so rather than people uh experiencing something uh as outlandish or, or extreme as you know what you're finding when you look at it as a no, no, relatively normal human being uh okay so for jez gordon uh we have a lot of uh you know sort of like on brand black and white very effective use of broken solids to convey light and texture a lot of hatching and spatter for like shadow um actually, which is sort of the distinctive quality, I think, uh, particularly for the Cursed Chateau. So uh, what do you think of Jez's art? Uh, I knew Jez for ages ago. He did some of the, he did like the layout for Bean to the Earth. And he always was really good. At, he's a good, great artist. But in particular, when I thought all well, the interior is going to be in black and white, keep it at a relatively same cost. As soon as I thought black and white, I thought Jez, because when I think about a modern crew of artist, He's the first person to leap to mind. He's done a variety of really intensely good uh, monochrome images. And I was lucky to get him to do this particular one. Uh, I think he's doing a not very exciting chapter, but hopefully he'll do a great image for it. Uh, again, I think you've mentioned like the quality of his images. Gigant like huge basses combined with energy, combined with this kind of scratchy apocalyptic style. He's done a whole variety, which you can see on his portfolio. Uh, if you want to take a look at those, uh, he's just very good at working in silhouette, I suppose. He's done a, he's good at doing a variety of things. He's done design, he does art, he's done a whole bunch, uh, and there are that spread over a variety of books by different people. 
if you look at a site, you can go and pick up some of those books, probably, I think. Illustration, photography, book design. So yeah, he does, he does it all. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, did you try and pair artists with chapters at all, or did you just take them as they oh, can? Initially, yes, because basically I emailed a whole bunch of people. Some didn't get back to me. Some took ages to get back, because I thought they wasn't going to hear from them. And so for the first people to get back, I discussed with them where they would best belong, or I'd want them to, to go. And so the people who replied earliest got what they wanted. <laughs> so um, Jason Thompson is doing a chapter one teens, which is about uh, an actual play series about a bunch of, at the time I took a bunch of teenage role players through an adventure and his style would be an almost perfect fit. It's what he requested, but it's also what it would have given him anyway. Jez, I'm afraid, was like the last person to get back to me. So he got like the, le the least interesting chapter. Uh, uh, Amanda Frank got back really quickly. We'll talk about her in a second. And she got false readings, which fits for her kind of story illustration style. Yeah, that makes sense. It was okay, partly so for... planning and partly like the look of the draw. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's how things are. Um, so for Peter Mullen, uh, I was pleased to see him being on board because uh, I enjoy a lot of the illustrations for Dungeon Crawl Classics and Mutant Crawl Classics. I haven't played the game, but I, uh, I think that they're really fun uh, a lot of the time. And I mean, for Peter, something is happening in, in his pictures. Like something is always transpiring uh, with, you know, what he's depicting, even if it's just like a character giving a look, um, you know, there's so, it's, it's like a portent um, every time. So uh, very imaginative uh, and just action oriented, so fun. What do you think of Peter? Oh yeah, like there's his, he does like a bunch of different styles. And if we're talking about his RPG stuff, they overflow with like life, I think, because of these slightly cartoonish figures, but embedded in these very kind of sometimes ridiculous and sometimes very somber realities. But they're always in the act of adventure. There's these vast kind of um, what would you call them? These you talk about scenes earlier, like a John Martin scene or like a Fall of Rome scene. So they're always these kind of these weird and intense environments. And they're always engaged in the process of one guy's being sacrificed by a priest. There's someone else sneaking up behind them. Someone's opening a treasure chest. It's always in the act of doing. I suppose that there's a, a continuity between him and uh, Jason Thompson. It's like they're very much images of action, of doing, of the act of adventure, of people, characters engaged in these kind of complex situations with multiple powerful living entities in these very particular like um scenarios so you kind of live into the image as soon as you see them you're like there's a guy sneaking around behind a boulder there's a giant wandering around uh as soon as you see it you're thinking you're imagining yourself as that guy hiding from the giant or as the giant you can't really look in his rocky stuff without kind of feeling like you're in the world or that you want to be in it yep thanks for like what was it? The design of Half Life Two. One of the designs talked about gets, which is like when you're trying to um, embed the player into the world. It's not just a question of giving them information. There has to be like an action, that, an interruption, something that they do that involves them with the structure of the world, and they built their design around that. So every time they're trying to involve you in their imagined reality, it's not just a question of like blasting you with stuff. It's like there has to be some procedure of play that brings you in. And like uh, Peter Mullins and uh, Jason Thompson's art is very much about that. It's like bringing you in through this imagined synergy of action. Mm -hmm. Oh, that makes sense because <clears throat> sometimes somebody will draw a really fascinating creature, a vista, or something like that. But uh, it can be hard to imagine how it be how it be actualized, and somehow that does take away from its its potential life. Um, so yeah, the idea that you put it in a scene to bring it to life or to get the sense that it could be interacted with, I think is probably a pretty essential element um, to at least a really, really effective scene. Okay, so um, for Amanda Frank, she does a lot of very interesting creatures uh, and also scenes that, you know, even when they have minimal human habitation, seem to have a sense of drama um, without it necessarily being foreboding every time, which is maybe a pitfall. So uh, she reached out to you, to you early, uh, what happened? Uh, I, let me see, uh, I was aware of Amanda for like a while because, let me say, I followed her Instagram for a while 
and I think Scrap turned me on to her, and she was one of the more interesting artists from like maybe the post OSR or kind of the mothership, the mothership or the indie, the Ichio aligned group of artists. And I remember I tended to like her more uh, abstract and weirder art. Um, let me see if I can find something on her Instagram. She does have one, but I forgot to link it in the Kickstarter. But um, she tends to produce things that are kind of more storybooky than I would usually have, that are a bit more languid and human. If I was going to say... Yeah, Jess is very going... stark. Mullen and Thompson are very much about play, and these are very much more like... They have like a different tonality of emotion to them. Uh, so I wanted her in. She was eager to do it, and I was like, oh, thank God. And I gave her false readings, which is basically a chapter about stories, narrative stories, instead of just me rambling about stuff in articles. And so it seemed like a perfect fit. Um, yeah, uh, makes sense. Well, I was going to say, I mean, you have done a few things in kind of a storybook character recently, but it's not languid. Uh, it does have that sense of play that goes, yeah. So. Okay, so um, with Daniel Porta, um, we have a pretty potent sense of the numinous in his work uh, is very effective at conveying that even with lots of color. Um, so it's like, it's, you know, full of characters, full of colors, uh, everything's filled in. It's not just like a skeletal beast against a black background or something like that. Um, but it has mystery and foreboding, which are traits that I would normally associate with uh, black and white, not necessarily, but just in the way that people tend to tend to try and convey it or draw it. Um, and he also is pretty good at giving uh, black and white art a sense of tactility. Um, so uh, how'd you find Daniel uh, Daniel Porta? He found me and I've known him for ages because when I was blogging back in 2017, he did images, just did them extempore. He was just interested in the blog. So he did a bunch of images that were related to uh, blog posts. And I have a piece of his art of the Navarx of Knox in my like house, which um, I bought from him after he did like a, a drawing of them. So that he's one of the only artists who's in the book like two times. He's in for a chapter heading for Uncertain Worlds, which I hired him for, but I also brought the right to reproduce the painting of the Navarx of Knox, which is like one of the only times in the book that someone is gets like two to two multiple two uh two full page spreads for an image uh i guess it's just an old relationship i used to keep a record of every time anyone illustrated stuff for my blog but i kind of fell off but if i was doing a book of the blog i would have to, i would have to have him in really because he he'd been there for years as like a, a correspondent and who'd been like already doing images and really i'm kind of sad that i can't include more of his stuff because some of it's in color and i couldn't afford to go full color for the interior so I'm glad I've got him for a chapter and I'm glad I've got him uh, illustrating something else in there as well. Well, it should still convey uh, the power of what he does, even without color. It's it's remarkable that he can, you know, that he can do it with all that, you know, lively color, but I think it will work in black and white just the same way. So, okay. So for uh, Valen Matthias, we have uh, stuff has got a kind of dark majesty, like uh, the kind of splendor and terror thing. Um, that we mentioned with 40k earlier, but obviously on a different wavelength. Um, yes. Yeah, it's and not. It's not like it's not depressing, which is I think a pitfall for this for this uh, kind of thing. He's not just depicting the the end of things. He's got a lot of very effective use of red, you know, gold, uh, blue, and so it makes it seem kind of alive, even if he's uh, even if he's depicting something that's patently not alive as we know it. But yeah, he produces these kind of pseudo occult, pseudo medieval things, which are kind of like uh pictures of images of saints from a an apocalyptic world or like the kind of saints or prophet you would see in nightmares but i've been a fan of his for i don't know how long a long time i have like a small study he did of some clouds and moon in my house but that was expensive and so i thought if i'm going to do a book and if i can hire whichever artist i want he was one of the ones who was kind of like a more i didn't know him and he wasn't really connected to the culture that i'm in but uh, he was one of the few who, who was really expensive who wrote back and I was like, yes, I'll do it. So I was like, hooray. Uh, and let me see, what is he doing? He is doing chapter six. I read a book. I don't know what I'll do for it. Right now with the Kickstarter, he's one of the more expensive ones. So we're still clawing, crawling our way towards him to try and reach his, his limit. We've uh, attained everyone up to this point, but now we are a couple, about hundred pounds away from getting Valen from doing something. And I yeah, will email him soon to ask him to to, quite, to beg him to uh, blog about it. 
<laughs> See if well, that would be, uh, yeah, well, I mean, it'd be worth it. I mean, just to bring another piece of his work into existence. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, hopefully we but push that over. There's a degree of self-indulgence with this because for everyone who produces physical art, I asked them for the original copy as part of their quote because I didn't. Uh -huh. just, I also wanted to literally collect the art of the the book interior, which is a uh, something I, <laughs> I I may be able to do depending on how all the Kickstarter goes. Well, that makes sense. I mean, having a uh, really, really. I mean, obviously, you like the the genuine article, you know, like the physical artifact, mm -hmm. but just having beautiful or fascinating art in your area is worth a lot from a quality of life perspective that's for sure so um with dirt and this is where i'm going to perhaps begin to push people's names um so we have dirk detweiler and i'm going to say lady for the last name i don't know if that's correct do you i've never pronounced i've never pronounced his surname to him but let's assume yeah it should be fine okay. dirk uh, detweiler lady so yeah. um he's got extreme i mean yeah, he did silent titans for you right or right, the cover yes. for that so extremely uh, interesting yeah. use of perspective you know, in interlocking the, sections. The interior as well. I did all the maps and all of the interior images. And uh, yeah, he's a remarkable artist. I was lucky to work with him. Um, really like enlightened and uh, did an incredible piece of work on that book. Because I was familiar with him because I knew he was very good. He was one of the people who I also I um, immediately emailed straight away because I wanted him involved. Uh, hard to describe what he does. He's not like anyone else. His aesthetic is quite different to almost everybody else on this list. They're like cubist map nightmares, but also portraits. If you look at like the maps he did inside Silent Titans, they're a combination of map and remarkable. He has a thing for isometric. He does he produced a book called uh The Bloodship. Let me see. I think I have it here. But that's another one where he produces elements of it are kind of almost gamist. The like, uh, I think, but oh yeah, Beksinski trying to do a Nintendo game almost, um, or the better earlier Picasso was trying to do a Nintendo game. Uh, it's kind of he's very clearly influenced by the fantasy aesthetic, but he takes everything in his own entirely original direction. Uh, he will be doing crypto culture, which is me talking about culture, and hopefully we'll give him some fields to innovate on. But if you want to have a look at his stuff, he has like an Instagram and a bunch of other things going on. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Very geometric. Sure. And it'll break out of the mold suddenly. And it's like, yeah. oh, he doesn't have to draw that way. He just likes to. And what he can do normal. Right. You know. Yeah. He works in color really well as well. Um, if you want to see his color stuff, he's done a bunch of different books. Bring Me Her Bones. And I think stuff for a bunch of other people. But yeah, his art is spread out around the place. I feel like he's an artist in search of some kind of synergy with a writer or a publisher or something which will kick him into because whatever he's doing it's not like anything else it's really good but I feel like it hasn't met its perfect ex capitalistic expression if you will mm -hmm. I feel like there's some kind of product or some kind of book or some kind of like artwork that people will suddenly see it like oh this is that guy something that encapsulates what he does really well but that also uh, is very successful um kind of waiting for that right now yeah. but uh yeah I, 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 I gotta ask um do you have a trilobite in a in a crest on your arm uh a tattoo yes. of a trilobite i do yeah do you have that for veins of the earth um, that is fucking amazing it's, well, it's a pretty simple tattoo. I don't know if it's like, <laughs> no. like my tattoos get better in quality as they go down the arm, and I haven't done one for um uh demon bone sarcophagus yet, but I probably have to get that done. But I had a long pause between Silent Titans and any new book, so I kind of got out of the habit. But my plan was to have a tattoo for every published book work and to basically work my way down my arm. But yeah, uh for Vince and the other, it was a massive. A massive book, so I got a large tattoo in a place I don't usually see, which is on the rear. And I didn't want any of the normal creatures from Veins of the Earth, because as beautiful as they are, they're all kind of horrific. I didn't want any... I kind of prefer to have generally positive symbology on my body, because mm -hmm. my life is, like, <laughs> troubled enough. So the Trail by Night is, like, one of the only good elements from Veins of the Earth. So um, mm -hmm. I have That's that fucking on. amazing. Uh, can I see it again? um the one on the upper shoulder that man one. yeah yeah fucking amazing uh, and i just mean like the the connection between you know your art and then here it is manifest or your your writing and then here it is manifested in real life you know in the physical 
you know, sort of totem. Uh, mm. That's what I love. It is a simple symbol, but just the, just this, its existence is pleasing. Okay. All right. So um, we have, uh, and I'm sorry, Anna. Uh, we have <laughs> Anna Palanchuk. <laughs> I'm going to say Anna Palanchuk. Um, <laughs> Uh, so pretty amazing refinement of the kind of positive. So she's, she does um, physical models, but mm -hmm. specifically in the style of uh, what you would have for a tabletop war game. Um, and so an amazing refinement of the kind of possibilities suggested by really uh, occult looking art, um, but, you know, then refine an actual 3D models. Uh, and it's got this kind of like, it's, it's very weird, but it's got this kind of like radical coldness and splendor mm -hmm. brought together that's powerful just to, uh, well, just to look at. Um, so it does a lot of modeling, um, maybe some physical art too, but uh, I believe you're commissioning a photograph of physical models for the yeah. work itself. I'm asking for a model and, and then for her to photograph it in her style. But yeah, she is someone who is kind of connected to the miniatures world and connected to the Blanchett Sioux style uh, which is a style of painting and uh, mini creation that kind of evolved or came down from John Blanche. Uh, and she's quite famous. She has her own like website and is basically a kind of a mistress or a mistress of, mistress of dark paracosms of miniature art. Uh, she creates the, she paints, she kit bashes, she produced her own sculptures. I think she's produced her own games and she's well known kind of her and a bunch of other like really intense artists to get together and they have like um miniature building like uh processes or competition not competitions but like uh events where they all put together a highly hyper individualized war band of some kind and it takes them like ages to do it and then they go to somewhere in poland and they play like games over a day or a week or something where you have all these kind of like works of art uh processing across the gaming board which has also been hyper individually made and which or the, I mean, it's kind of like a gaming event but also like a surrealist and nightmarish art event at the same time mm -hmm. so you can kind of make anything she does interesting if you look at her instagram she has a bunch of cars which are based on hot wheels for oh, like love those. Yeah. Gas lands, and they're I amazing love those. they're yeah. just like <laughs> they're so beautiful and strange it's kind of like what how did you take these like <laughs> these like um matchbox cars and turn them into like these works of high gothic intensity but yeah, yeah that's how like, everything she does is kind of ends up like that yeah they're, they're almost chilling somehow to look at mm. uh, yeah okay so last we have uh alex Sorensen. um he does a lot of interesting work with pure color uh sans visible line not always but you know for the most part so uh how'd alex come around uh, or alex I I kind of knew him for a while. I think he worked on um, a book by Chris McDowell called Into the Odd uh, or Electric Bastion Land. He's just really an amazing, almost an amazing pure artist, an amazing pure drawer. And uh, in terms of like pure skill, I mean, he's not lacking in expression, but in terms of pure skill, he's really, really, really exceptional and probably underpaid at whatever he's doing. Mm -hmm. um and i thought i he was someone who doesn't check his instagram so i messaged him and i didn't hear back from him so i was thinking well that's the last i'll hear from that guy uh, and then he came up very late in the day and said oh i'm sorry i don't check my instagram messages but I, i'd be happy to do something so he's going in as an extra for as an end piece um because i'd already filled the chapters but i'm just like very happy to have him on the um to, I consider him like a fine artist who just works in a genre style. And again, he has these like, he's not quite like any of the other creators in terms of his subject matter uh, or his, like the emotional valency of his art. He's not really, he has dark and gothic elements to it. I guess the one he's most like in terms of the emotion would be Amanda Frank. It's kind of much softer, a combination of fierceness and softness uh, and very, very deeply human. Lots of like these uh, very clear, particularly human figures where you kind of um you're drawn into their expression there uh lots of female figures as well which is relatively unusual for me i'm like i'm big on storms and monsters and guys with swords and that's like 90 percent of the rest of the book and so far I like which like he goes in a very different direction yeah it makes sense okay so well that runs through that um are there 
if you could if you could pick any other artist out there and just have them do something for the book uh is there anybody that is there anybody that springs the mind yeah, someone who did my back a guy called killian eng who does a variety of different art things but he produces the he's a little bit like alex Sorensen, but he produces these very deeply uh, let me see if i can google him he does like uh huge paintings of some with very fantastic elements to them but they're so rich in this finely imagined detail um they're very beautiful uh and he's very expensive and i don't even if he had written back i don't think i could afford him but he produced i think he uses some digital elements if you google killian then he's done some like album covers some main some paintings uh there's one called the sculptor's chamber he's got twitter as well he's just really 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 beautiful um he reminds me a bit of mobius or of that bande destiny french comic style he's producing something but also a little bit like an edo print or he has this like art nouveau element to him and i can't really describe him well i don't have the language but if you look at his images you'll see uh wondrous landscapes of the imagination basically Cool. Well, I'm always after that. Um, before we wrap, I want to give shout outs to three artists who I've uh, commissioned art from and had also had a really good experience commissioning art from. Um, Evelyn Moreau, uh, just most of most of her stuff that she puts out is only really on her Patreon from what I've seen, but it's only a dollar a month. Um, and she puts out just amazing stuff like line art that's full of life, uh, full of character, distinctive, unique just this warm ups every day. Uh, she just puts out stuff that, you know, contains, uh, I guess, conceptual energy sufficient for a much, much more uh, in-depth uh, illustration. Um, and very good to work with. Uh, Eric Belial, B-E-L-I-S-L-E. -E. He did a bunch of art for uh, Pathfinder, for Pathfinder Pawns, uh, which are something that I love, but unfortunately they're discontinuing them. Oh um, no some reason like of all the things that they could discontinue why not discontinue the game and just keep on producing <laughs> just keep on producing I'm trying to start feel about war the 40,000 which is like just stop making rules because you're bad at that stop making rules for the main exactly. game and produce everything else exactly well for Pathfinder funds you can use them for anything you know just like miniatures and so so why not but in any case they're they're discontinuing them, but I know I have the contact information for the company who produces them so if uh, if uh, <laughs> The time ever comes, then it'll be it will be done. But in any case, um, Eric Belial uh, just produces some uh, beautiful and just very well done uh, character art. I recommend you look them up um, and uh, check it out. They're very approachable. Uh, and then um, lastly is a fellow named Matthias, and that's all the information I have about who he is. Besides um, that, his web page is Bacon Strap as in using bacon as a strap, bacon strap. Um, and he does a lot of very, very good cyberpunk art that has like a sense of life and humanity and, and sort of like goodness to it. Not all of it, but like, you know, a sense of goodness to it, which is unusual for cyberpunk uh, to be done effectively in like a non-saccharine way. And so uh, Matthias is uh, and also really good to work with. Uh, so those are the three I wanted to mention for now. Um, do you have anything you're gonna else? Put, you're gonna put links in the description down below? Sure, yeah, I should. Good yeah. idea. So that'll help people find them. Yeah. Oh, that was that was thank you. That was a fun discussion, which I hope I didn't uh, ruin by not knowing that much about my subject. No, no, actually it was amazing. Uh actually you uh, are able to discuss these things to a fine gradient. That's amazing. Uh, and so I think I think well, I enjoyed it, and I'm sure anyone who watches it will too. Oh, I hope so. Oh, by the way, don't forget my Kickstarter. There's like nine days left. If yes. You want to go that, help, help me get volume of for my um for my book. That would be super nice if you're watching. Yeah. All right. Thanks a lot, Patrick. I'm going to pause the recording. Bye.